Welcome to the ninth session. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your divine wisdom, knowledge, and love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Welcome again to the ninth session. What we talked about last week were the sacraments of initiation. We had at least two of them. We talked about baptism and confirmation. And now we come to the third sacrament of initiation. There are three sacraments, baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. So today we'll be talking about Eucharist. One of the things I'd like to use as a beginning here, because I think it's very, very pertinent, was a, was a birthday party. A birthday party of a woman who was celebrating her 70th birthday. And the family wanted to get together. They wanted to have a surprise party for her. So she had 10 children. And the 10 children were preparing everything. They rented a hall. The 10 children were there. The in-laws were there. The grandchildren were there. They were going to have a wonderful party to celebrate her birthday, something she would never forget. Her two daughters, or two of the daughters, they lured her to the hall where the party was going to be held by telling her they were taking her out for dinner for her birthday. And so she came along with them, and to her surprise, when she entered the hall, there was the whole family waiting for her and, of course, shouting, Happy Birthday! And she could look around and they were all there celebrating the fact that they were celebrating a woman who had given so much of her life for others. They came, they greeted her, they hugged her, they kissed her, they brought gifts to her. And so it was a day that they thought would be wonderful for her and something made them all feel happy. And toward the end, they asked her to say a few words. And she stood up and she said, well, I want to thank you all for the gift, not just the gifts you brought today, but for the gift of loving each other as you do and for loving me. I'm really grateful for that gift. And that means more to me than anything else. And so God has blessed me. God blessed all of you by allowing you to love one another as you do. And so that was a wonderful party for her. And in many ways, that party parallels what we're going to be saying about Eucharist. In this session on Eucharist, we're going to talk about various ways of worshiping God. And so we look and say, what happened at that gathering? Well, what happened, they remembered the past. They remembered how much their mother had done for them. They celebrated a meal. They came together together. They celebrate a meal together. That's what people do at parties. They don't simply say, we're having a party, but just let's say hello and share gifts. They have a meal. And then after they have the meal, then they begin to look back over their life and say, you know, there's so many times you had to sacrifice for us. Imagine raising all those children. And so they could talk about that. But then the biggest part as she said at the end, was they all came together. There were a community there at worship. And they were a community there honoring her on her birthday. And it came down to that simply sending a card. Of course, that wouldn't be enough. They had to come together in a form of a community. And that'll be basically what we'll be talking about today. Worship. How do we worship? So the first question is, why do people worship? When archaeologists went back through studies of many ancient cultures, one of the things that seemed to be in many, many of them was some kind of a worship of a supreme being, someone who was greater than they were, someone they felt like they had to offer sacrifices for, or at least offer something to that God, whoever it might be. And very often when things went wrong, they would worship out of fear. The hurricane winds came, the rains came, earthquakes came, 
Volcanoes came. They saw all these things and they're saying, the gods are angry. And so they worshiped out of fear. And then when everything was very, very nice, they worshiped the gods just to appease the gods and say, well, <laughs> I hope it's always be good to us as you are now. So to avoid this new disaster. And then we as Catholics, we worship God. We know that we have a love of God, but we have to admit that there is some of us who worship out of fear alone. We're afraid of being damned, sent to hell. So we worship God. God, I'm going to worship and be, be the person you want me to be because I'm afraid of going to hell. But then there's others who worship God out of a kind of reverential fear. I mentioned before that when I speak of reverential fear, a good example is that I feared hurting my mother. She's smaller than I am. She was someone I could have hurt that way. But the fear I had was hurting her in a different way. The fear I had was a fear that said made her feel bad, unhappy with me. It was a reverential fear. She did so much, I honored her a great deal. And so what happened was I had this reverential fear. In the scriptures, we read that fear is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And so what it's saying to us really is a reverential fear of God. Whenever the scriptures speak about fear, they very often speak about a reverential fear. And it helps us to understand really what the scriptures are saying. We should have a reverential fear for God. That means look at all God did for us, but not just to pay a debt. Some people worship as a form of paying back a debt. After all you did to pay for me, I owe this to you. But, but that's really not the best kind of fear or love or reverential fear. It's really saying, I love it because you showed me love by all the wonderful things you did for me. So it's being different in many ways. Some worship fully out of love. Some can love God so deeply that that becomes a center of their life, the reason they do their best living as good a life as they can. So some worship fully out of love. As Catholics, we worship God in the Eucharist. We express our love for God. Jesus taught us how to express our love for God. And we learned what God expects of us from Jesus. Jesus taught us these things by his way of life, by his messages, and finally by his Last Supper. So what happens is that a family, it comes together. It was at the Last Supper, the gathering of the community, that Jesus gave us the Eucharist. And we know that we want to get together, we want to celebrate a meal. And it was at a meal that Jesus gave us the Eucharist. And so Jesus gave us the Eucharist in the midst of community. And then we look and say, well, what, what was this all about? What it was all about was that Jesus came because Jesus loved us. And Jesus could say, I want you to remember what I'm doing for you. He says, do this in remembrance of me. And then we recall the sacrifice. This is my body, this is my blood, which will be broken up for you, which will be destroyed for you. And so the second thing is sacrifice. And where is it celebrated? In a meal. And then after the meal, the communities. That's what we'll be speaking about, four aspects today of worship. So in worship, we have the memorial, we have recalling the past, then we have the meal itself, then we have the sacrifice, and then we have community. So begin with memorial. Why is the memorial so important? Our ability to remember, that is basic to our humanness. If we were to lose our ability to really remember, we'd become frightened we would also lose a foundation for our life. Life is really shaped by our memories, memories of family, memories of what we did as children, as we grew, what, what struck us most, 
We have so many memories, memories in our life, and we build our life on those memories. And actually, we can look to the future because we know the past. We shape our identities according to our memories. So one of the things about human beings is that if we lose our memories, we feel lost ourselves. We are lost. There's a song that speaks about memories. It says, yesterday is a memory. The history is a, the, the future is a mystery. Yesterday is history, of course. The future is a mystery, of course. And now what we have is the present. And that's a gift. And so the gift is what we live now. But we build the gift on the past and we have hope for the future. That's where memory comes in. We have to build the future on the past, on our memories. Historical religions like Catholicism, Judaism, we're an historical religion. We are religion built on memories of the past and promises made by the prophets of the past, made by Jesus. That's what we build our spiritual memories upon. So we look to the past, we have hope for the future because of the promises, because of Jesus. In the Psalms, they have a great respect for Jerusalem because Jerusalem is the city of God. That's the presence of God. And one of the Psalms said, may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, O Jerusalem. To forget Jerusalem would be to forget their link with God. Each year, the Jewish people recall a major memory in the history of their nation. They recall that at one time they were in slavery. They left the slavery of Egypt, went across the desert to the promised land. But before they left, they sacrificed a lamb. And then they came together and they shared together in the sharing of that lamb. They would gather together for this great feast and they would remember this is what their freedom was built upon. They went from slavery in Egypt to the promised land. So at the Passover feast, what does happen? They come together. Jesus was a good Jew, as were his followers. And so they meet, they come together at the Passover liturgy. The Passover meal they share together. And so now they come together and now they celebrate this living memorial. But then Jesus in this living memorial, he takes the bread and he blesses it. And he, and he says, this is my body. Then he takes the wine and he blesses the wine. He says, this is my blood. Then he says, do this in remembrance of me. Put it into your memory. Make it part of your memory, not just to say, oh, I remember that. No, a living memory. The idea that what happened then is still happening now. Jesus told us, I'll give you my flesh and blood to eat. When he told the followers, his followers one time, I'm going to give you my flesh to eat and my blood to drink. Someone said, this is a difficult, this is a difficult saying. They couldn't understand it. And so some left. Jesus saw Peter, the, some of the disciples. And Jesus said, are you also going to leave? And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? The idea is it takes faith to believe that Christ is present in that bread, that wine. But at the same time, to whom shall we go? We really believe, we don't completely understand because it's a spiritual reality. And yet it's Christ. And so that's what Eucharist is about, the presence of Christ in our midst in some way. To whom shall we go? Peter and the disciples had to be with Jesus to gradually understand what a sacramental presence was, what it really meant to be sacramental. We have physical presence. This is my physical presence. We have a spiritual presence. I know I can pray. A sacramental presence in some sense gathers them all together and it takes a different appearance, but at the same time, it's still Christ, very much Christ present among us. So Jesus offers us a living memorial in the Eucharist. Every time we share in Christ's passion, death, resurrection, we, the church, are worshiping God. 
And the most perfect form of worship is the Eucharistic celebration. That's the Catholic belief. The Catholic belief is that there's no other form of worship more important or more powerful or more wonderful than the gift of Christ. It's a living memorial because it remembers the past, it looks to the future, and it's celebrated always in the present. So the name the church gives to the celebration, the Eucharist, it means thanksgiving, to thanks, to give thanks. We sometimes refer to the Eucharistic liturgy as the Mass, but more properly, it's called the Eucharist. The Eucharist carries out the idea, it's a thankful celebration. We're thankful to God for the gift that God gives us. And so it's so important that all the other sacraments, if possible, should take place within the Eucharistic liturgy. And so now we see baptisms taking place at Sunday liturgy. We see people beginning to commit themselves to Christ at a liturgy. And so these things are happening over and over again at liturgies, the Eucharistic liturgy. The Eucharist is the source and the summit of our Christian life. Central to our life, of course, it's the source, the, the Eucharist. All our endeavors, they flow from the Eucharist. Everything we do in a spiritual sense, prayers, activities, etc., they all come from the Eucharist. Then they move towards the Eucharist. They prepare us to enter more fully into the Eucharist. It's so central that actually we can say, the reason I can really say my life has worth, spiritual worth, is because of the Eucharist. The reason I can say I want to make it even more perfect is because of the Eucharist. And this takes place in the present. Then we come to the idea, well, we have a memorial. We know that Christ gave us that gift. Where does this happen? Jesus didn't tell this to the apostles on the road. They had a meal. So a meal is important. So why is it so important? Because in the time of Jesus, a meal was considered an entry into someone's life. So when someone said celebrate a meal with someone, went to celebrate a dinner, what was happening, they're saying, I'm accepting your way of life. Many people were scandalized by Jesus. They were scandalized because he ate with sinners and tax collectors. People they thought were bad people, and it was, they would see that as saying, look at him, he's eating with sinners and tax collectors. He must be a sinner and a tax, he must be a sinner. Tax collectors were automatically recognized as sinners. And so they would say that. But then Jesus also ate with Pharisees, the religious leaders. So Jesus, in a sense, had a foot in every part of life for most people. And then as we look at that idea of Eucharist, every eating story in the scripture, every meal story in the scriptures is a story of Eucharist. And so we take it that way that every single story that talks about Jesus either entering the house of someone or sharing a meal with someone, that is a Eucharistic story. That tells us something about the Eucharist. There's a story about a man named Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus is a tax collector. And we can picture him moving the coins all around on a table. But then he gets word, Jesus is coming. He's never seen this Jesus. So he wants to see him. So he goes and he climbs a tree. It says he was small of stature. Perhaps that's a play on words. Perhaps the idea is that he's a small thinking person. But he climbs this tree and he's in the tree and Jesus comes by and all of a sudden Jesus stops. Jesus looks up and Jesus says to him, Zacchaeus, today I'm going to stay at your house. I'm going to be with you, live with you. All those things are involved in staying at your house. And Zacchaeus comes down and immediately he's converted. Everything I have, I return anybody I, to anybody I cheated. I return fourfold. Zacchaeus now has entered to Jesus' life. And Jesus' idea when he ate with sinners and tax collectors was not that he was becoming like them. He was wanting them to become like him. Really giving and loving and sharing. And so we can see the meal. 
there's a reference to the Eucharist as the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, the breaking of the bread. There's a story in the scriptures where Jesus is walking with two men on the road to Emmaus on the day of Christ's resurrection. They're really sad. They think he has died. They're not sure what's going to happen now. They believed he was the Messiah. Suddenly their world fell apart. And as it gets late, they say to him, well, come on in and stay with us. Don't bother going on. So he goes in and he stays with them. And then during the meal, he takes the bread and blesses it and takes the wine and blesses it. And it says their eyes will open and then he disappears. And they go running to the other disciples. They say, we recognized him in the breaking of the bread. What they're really saying is, we recognized him in the Eucharistic liturgy. And so that's the breaking of the bread. So he shared meals during his life. is telling us more each time about the Eucharistic celebration. He didn't just dine with good people. Jesus dined with sinners. Sinners find love and change in their life with Jesus. And so even for us, sometimes we go to worship and somebody might say, oh, look at so-and-so up there. Everybody knows he or she is a sinner. Well, maybe they should be there to gain grace. It's not knowing they're gaining them even. They might look like hypocrites. They might be hypocrites in many ways. But very gradually by coming and sharing and worshiping and sharing in some way, they are people who are being changed by Jesus. So Jesus says himself, he didn't just come for those who are well. He comes for the sick also. So Jesus, the meal is very important. If we go back to that birthday party again, they could have sent a card and wished their, their mother a happy birthday. But that wouldn't do it. They had to come together as community. That's the celebration. And then the other aspect of celebration, sacrifice. We remember sacrifice. The understanding the Eucharistic liturgy is to understand sacrifice. And there were many ways that the people of ancient worlds, they, they offered, they praised God, they would offer sacrifice of some kind. They would take their best animal or their best crop and they would offer it to God. That seems simple to us. But to them, to take the best and give it to God, that really carved a place deeply into their life. And so what happened was it was a real offering, something very important, something they might not naturally have wanted to do, but they gave it to God because God was important to them or the gods were important to them, depending upon whether it was believers in God the, who created the world or the many gods. So their image of God would also determine the type of offering they made, the sacrifice. So there's always sacrifice involved in some way in worshiping God. The Israelites, they had a dependence on God. They took their best lamb and offered it. There's times in the scriptures when some didn't offer their best. It was time for offering. And they said, well, we'll offer this. We'll offer a lesser lamb, one that's crippled maybe. And so they offer that and God is displeased. It's as though for us today to say, God, I'm going to make an offering to you. I'll offer what's left over. Instead of saying, I'm offering what's important to me and to you, God. I want my sacrifice to be a sacrifice of myself, not what's left over. So the ancient Israels, they, they, they had these worship and their sacrifices. When they brought it to their priest, what happened with their priest, the priest, by the way, in the Old Testament, they became priests by birth. They belonged to the priestly family. So once they were born into that family, they were considered a priest, and they would grow up and have charge of the temple in some way. But then what happened now, it's a cultic sacrifice. They bring their sacrifice to the priest. Once the sacrifice is offered and slaughtered on the altar, or somehow consecrated on the altar, it's a sacred offering. It now belongs to God. And this was really important to those people. If it belonged to God, then they could share in it or else they had to burn it. There were two kinds of offerings, at least two. One was burnt offerings. Everything was burnt completely. 
or the other was a communion offering. They communion together. They ate together. And so the Fred's did sound the uh, sacrifice of offering the lamb. That was a communion sacrifice. They offered it to God. Some pieces were left with God, but then they took the other home and they called in all relatives, friends. They gathered together and they celebrated the Passover feast. The prophets and wisdom writers, they talk about God being pleased very much with these burnt offerings, with these offerings from the people. But then at the same time, they would challenge the people. They would say, you know, these burnt offerings, that's not enough. It has to be offering of yourself. God wants a loving heart, a forgiving heart, a giving heart. The way we come to Eucharist is to be that kind of a person. And that takes sacrifice too. Being a forgiving person, that's a lot of sacrifice involved in that. Being a loving person, in many cases, a great deal of sacrifice. So this is the way they did. The sacrifice of uh, a person's offering was a sign of their unity with God. They bonded their life with God. God bonded their, his life with the people. Even with Jesus, Jesus gave us a bonding by saying, this is my body, this is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. This will be shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. It bonded Jesus' life to ours. So Jesus sacrificed then. He made his will totally given to us, but especially given to God. Obedience was a big part of Jesus' offering sacrifice. Often it speaks about Jesus being obedient. That's how his sacrifice was made perfect. He says, your body you have given to me. You've prepared a body for me. Now I'm going to live according to it. And he says in the scriptures, I've come to do your will. And then we see what happens in the garden. He's suffering. And he wants to get away from the pain. He wants to avoid it. If it be possible, Father, let this cup, the cup of suffering, let this cup pass for me. But then obedience. Not as I will, but as you will. Part of his sacrifice is the willingness to do God's will. It says in the letter to the, in when the, letter to the Philippians, he was obedient to God, obedient to death. And so his obedience is part of his sacrifice. Jesus brought us salvation by being obedient right down to the end. So in our sacrificial meal, we share the gift that God gives us. So we do have, we don't have the cultic priesthood like they had in the Old Testament though. The priest now, the ordained priest, the Catholic priest, he doesn't offer to God on our behalf. He joins in the celebration with all of us. This is one of the reasons that we now have the ordained priest facing towards the people. It's not like everything goes through him to God. It's the idea he now belongs to the community, he calls everything together, holy order, but at the same time, we worship along with each other. We are the community at worship, or worshiping and offering our sacrificial meal. So then what about the Catholic community? We say we worship together, we have, again, memorial, a meal, sacrifice, but we need a community. Community is really important. And sometimes we say, well, I'm going to go and pray to God in private, which is what we should do and do do. But the fact is, Jesus says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. When Jesus offered his sacrificial meal, the Last Supper, he gathered his disciples together. And then the community comes together and it celebrates a common memory. And that's what community is. When we worship, we're celebrating a common memory. We know that we're celebrating the sacrifice, the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus. It's a community memory. It's part of our heritage, part of our memorial. So a memorial is not an individual memory. The memorial we celebrate is a community memory. That family that came together to celebrate their mother's birthday, what happened was they had a common, a common way of thinking. It was a memorial actually, but it wasn't an individual memory. It was a memory of them together, growing up together, being cared for together and thinking together. So it's the community accepting Jesus and his message. 
And then the community comes together. We celebrate a ritual meal. Jesus offered us his body and blood. Again, I mentioned that's at the community. The community gathers to celebrate this. An important aspect of a living community, a living memorial, is the gathering. The family as a community worships in Christ's name. All of our prayers and through Christ our Lord. At the elevation in the uh, liturgy, when we hold up the bread and the wine, we say through him, through Christ, with him, with Jesus, will through him, with him, and in him, Jesus, is to you, God the Father. Everything we do is through Jesus. And so that's what our offering is. We're a community, but we celebrate our common memory of sharing and praising and, and God together. So the other thing, too, we shouldn't come together as silent spectators. We're people taking part in a sacred action. And so we don't just sit there in a corner by ourselves. We can expect ourselves to be able to say, I'm going to join in the praying, in the singing. I, I usually tell people about the singing. I say, you know, if God gave you a good voice, use it to praise God. If God gave you a bad voice, use it to get even. The idea being, that's a gift or no gift, but let's offer it to God, whatever comes out. Join in, be part of the community. And so worship God as part of the community. So we're not meant to be a silent spectator. We're people taking part in a sacred action. And again, we can expect sinners to be part of that memorial. We invite them in to our worshiping community to join the banquet. It's like someone who is not dressed for the wedding. We invite them in perhaps and celebrate with us. And then the community also, it celebrates common giving. It's a service to others. In the Gospel of John, there's no mention of Jesus taking the bread and wine and making it his body and blood. But what John does, the writer of the Gospel of John, what he does, he says, act as a Eucharistic community. And acting as a Eucharistic community, we look at Jesus. Jesus has already spoken to them earlier in that scripture about his body and blood. But now he's teaching them another reason, another thing, another message. And he washes their feet. What a surprise. In those days, there was dirt on the ground. They wore sandals. Their feet were dirty. And it was part of the reception of the host to have slaves come and wash the feet of those who were invited to the dinner. Jesus took the position of a slave. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. This humiliated them. Peter said, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus says, if you don't let me wash your feet, I'll have no part of you. And Peter says, wash my whole body. Lord, if that's what it takes, I give myself totally to you. But then Jesus says, well, you know, you call me master and Lord. That's who I am. But if I have done this for you, so you should do it for others. And so as disciples of Jesus, we meant to go out and share that service. That's a Eucharistic people. We're meant to share this common sacrifice, this common memorial, the common meal with others. As a community, we're called to sacrifice, not just as an event that took place in the past. We don't just look back and say, look what Jesus did at the Last Supper. Jesus is still doing it now. What you do for the least of mine, you do for me. It's still happening. We join our hearts to the heart of Christ, and we join our sacrifice, our actions, to the actions of Christ. All this is contained in Eucharist. What are some components of the Eucharistic liturgy, Eucharistic celebration? The Eucharistic celebration unites all people in a common form of worship. One of the things that happens is that they came together for the supper, for the Paschal mystery. They knew what was going to happen. They had kind of a ritual they followed. We have a ritual that we follow. We have a ritual for the Eucharistic liturgy. And what rituals do, they enable a community to worship together as one. The Eucharist is an action of the church, of Christ, and of the people. It's the assembly. That's another word for gathering together. We talk about parishioners or whatever. You know, we talk also when they come together to worship, they're called assembly. It's the center of the whole Christian life, as mentioned several times already, 
But then we have a general instruction of the Roman Missal. And that general instruction sets the format for our worship. How do we worship? Wherever we go in the world, that format will be followed. We might not know the language, but we know the format. We can recognize where we are in liturgy because we know what part of the liturgy we're at. And so the instruction down the, the instruction, the germ, general instruction, it offers us the two components. We have the liturgy of the word and then the liturgy of the Eucharist. And so they're interconnected. When we celebrate them, sometimes we're not conscious of the fact that they're really one single act of worship, but they're two components. So the first celebration, first part, first component, liturgy of the word. During the liturgy of the word, we listen to the word of God. We're like Jesus in the synagogue. Jesus went into the synagogue on the Sabbath, as was his custom, and they asked him to stand up and read, and he read from Isaiah the prophet. So he read a scripture passage. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Then he explained it. This scripture passage is being fulfilled in your presence. And so Jesus is the fulfillment of the literary form there of a homily. The liturgy of God, it flows from a synagogue service. Excuse me, liturgy of the word. It flows from the synagogue service. So liturgy of the word, for instance, we have readings. We listen to God's word, God speaking to us. That's what they did in the synagogues. They would have readings and then explanations. In the liturgy of the word, we have a gospel. But then before the gospel, we have readings from the Old Testament, Acts of the Apostles, a reading from the letters, mostly of Paul. And then it's followed by the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. We stand for the gospel because that's a sacred reading, more sacred than the others. It's what guides us in the New Testament. But then what happens is, as we do that, we're talking about Jesus being with us. So the synagogue service was now become part of our Eucharistic liturgy and time. Then we go into the second part, component. We talk about celebration of the liturgy of the Eucharist. The liturgy of the Eucharist, the sacrificial meal. After hearing God's word, the community responds in a sacrificial meal. In many ways, that celebration is like people meeting. When a man and woman meet and they're contemplating perhaps marriage, what happens is they talk with each other, they speak with each other, they get to know each other. That's liturgy of the word. God is speaking to us, telling us about God's self. We're learning about God. And God is speaking to us and saying, this is what I expect of you. We come to the gospel. Jesus tells us what's expected of us. It's a communication back and forth. And then when the couple has spoken for a long time, they, they now begin to say, I like what I'm hearing. And so they commit themselves to each other. They get engaged. They make some kind of commitment, an engagement ring, a symbol, a sign. We do the same in many ways. We bring up the bread and the wine, we make a commitment. The bread and wine is a symbol of our offering. We say, God, I like what I heard in the liturgy of the reading. I now am coming forward. I'm going to respond. I'm offering myself symbolically as this bread and wine. So we're offering ourselves to God. And then Jesus takes it and Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood. He makes our offering more perfect. He pulls us into himself. He draws our offering into his offering. It's now one. And then we come to communion. So the two who are looking towards marriage, they give this gift, the engagement ring. Then comes the wedding ceremony, and the two become one before God. And then what happens? They live a life of perfect communion together, sometimes difficult, sometimes not so perfect. But they live a life together, and then we share in communion in the Eucharistic liturgy. After we become one with Christ, we're offered the Eucharist and we take it in communion and we live our life and sometimes perfectly, sometimes not so perfectly. But that's the idea. It really follows life. So how's the liturgy of the word celebrated? The liturgy of the word begins with a period of preparation or introduction. The presider approaches the table of the Lord, which is a symbol of Christ. He kisses it 
reverences it, and then he leaves the table of the Lord and goes over to the chair. The community is singing a gathering song at this time. It's not an entrance song. It's a gathering song. It's not the song meant to get the ordained priest from the vestibule to the altar. That's not the idea. The idea is we're gathering our thoughts. We're now about to celebrate a really important way of worshiping God. So then what happens is the presider and the assembly, they sign themselves with the sign of the cross, and then they have a short greeting and a bit of a litany. The litany is not meant to be just simply saying, God, I'm sorry for all my sins. The litany is praise of God. Christ, you loved us so much you gave yourself for us. So that's kind of the litany. And so we have that little litany, so they sign, share in that. And then what happens after that, we have a prayer, and we have the Gloria rather than the prayer. Glory to God in the highest. We pray together. And after that, we pray, let us pray. And so we have a prayer for the day. And then we have the readings. The reading is taken from the scripture, a psalm, or the main part of the liturgy of the word. Again, there's ordinarily three separate readings. First reading from the Old Testament, Acts of the Apostles. And then we have another reading, which again could be Acts of the Apostles or a letter from one of the followers of Jesus after his resurrection. And one of the things about that, we should have a different reader for each one, if possible. The reason being, one symbolizes the Old Testament, one symbolizes the New Testament. The separate readers can bring out this difference. In the midst of those two, we have responsorial psalm, a psalm that responds to what we're hearing. Then we have the gospel reading. The gospel reading, again, from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, it tells us about how God, Jesus, is speaking to us. And then we have a homily. A homily is meant to explain the reading that we just heard. The homily is meant to bring the readings into our life. It's to connect the readings into our daily life as a community and as an individual. And so the homily should never be skipped, no matter when. Even if it's just a short homily for some reason, that it should never be skipped. And so the homily should not be overbearing, but at the same time, it should be something that instructs us, guides us, and tells us how to live out those passages from the scriptures. In the course of three years, the major part of the Bible is read on the Sundays. So it's the major part. There's some parts that are skipped as it's read, but a major part is read. So the homily is then as I said, it's given, but the major part's there. And then we make a profession of faith. After the homily, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, our profession of faith. We profess everything that we believe about Christ. The origin of that is in 325, the Council of Nicaea, when they were trying to figure out, was Jesus one with God or not? And so the Council of Nicaea, 325, that settled that. A little bit more added later on in the Council of Constantinople. But then, at that particular point, it was the foundation for the creed. Then after praying the creed, we pray the universal prayer. The assembly prays together, and it's a universal prayer. It's really not a time for personal concerns. That God will bless those throughout the world who are suffering with the coronavirus. We pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. And so we say that. That's a universal prayer. We might know people who are sick. We say for those who are suffering the pains of cancer, especially for Joe Thompson, who is suffering in the hospital, we pray, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray the universal part, and then we add the individual if we wish. But it's a universal prayer. And it's not a prayer of thanksgiving. We don't pray a prayer that says, in thanksgiving for all the gifts that God has given us and getting us here safely, we pray. That's not the kind of prayer it is. It's a petition prayer. And so it's meant to be a universal petition prayer. And then when we're finished with that, then we pray the um, presentation of the gifts. So we've had that. We pray the creed, the universal prayer. Now the presentation of the bread and wine usually brought forth. And sometimes the collection baskets brought forth with it very often. So then we come to liturgy of the Eucharist. What are some components of the liturgy of the Eucharist? 
the liturgy of the Eucharist begins with the preparation of the bread and the wine at the altar. So the ordained priest, the presider, takes the bread and wine and offers it, prays over it. And after he does that, he turns then to the assembly and he says, pray, brother and sister, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. We pray that the sacrifice we're offering will also join with that of Christ. After he has finished that, after he has finished his prayer, then the assembly stands and responds. And then we go on with the idea that we continue now, we say, pray a prayer, and then the Eucharistic goes on to the preface, where we talk about praising God. And we end that prayer by saying, holy, holy Lord God of hosts. And now we're ready for the, for the what we call the narrative. It's the institution narrative. It's instituting the Eucharist. So the priest takes the bread and wine and prays the word of Christ at the Last Supper. This is my body. This is my blood. That institution, at one time we used to call it the consecration, but institution narrative, that, that's more exacting. It's where he instituted the Eucharist. It brings our faith to the actual happening. In faith, we believe that the body and blood of Christ is now fully present in the sacramental form on the bread and wine. The presider then, when he's finished that, he calls upon the assembly to proclaim the mystery of faith. In the liturgy, it tells us to show the bread and the wine to the people. But now he calls the people to a mystery of faith. And the people have an acclamation of faith in the death, resurrection, ascension, and the second coming of Jesus. And then the liturgy, of the liturgy of the Eucharist continues. So it continues with prayers for the church. The presider, mindful of death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, prays that God will look favorably upon the church and bless the church with the gift of the Holy Spirit. The presider prays for the Pope, the bishop, the clergy, the people, and the deceased members, and places all of us in union with others who are praying with us, the saints, Mary, Joseph, the apostles, all the saints. The presider then elevates the body and blood of Christ. That's where elevation takes place. That's according to the rubric, this is the elevation point. Through him, and with him and in him. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ is to you, God the Father Almighty. At this point, the assembly proclaims the great amen. It's meant to be a really robust amen. Sometimes we're telling you, amen. It's not meant to be that. It's meant to be robust. I was teaching a high school class once, large class that time, and I told him, I said, you know, the amen should really be a strong one. We should always be ready to shout amen. And without thinking then, time went on. Then I celebrated Eucharistic liturgy for them. And when I came to that, they shouted amen so, so loud, I almost went out the window. But they at least heard me. They shouted amen, and I really jumped. And yet that's really what it should be. Not that we expect every assembly to be that way. It can say normally amen. But what they captured there was that it was the great amen. And the assembly now, they pray the Lord's Prayer. Again, the Lord's Prayer. We're always praying as a community. Our Father, give us this day our daily bread. It's always a community. Actually, salvation is that we put ourselves in union with the community. When we pray our private prayers, it would be a good idea to, to realize we're praying not just for ourselves, but for a community. And then we have a sign of peace. We share some kind of a greeting with each other something that says, the peace of Christ be with you and with your spirit. And this is meant to be a simple kind. It's meant to be with the people around us, almost like a chain. We do it to the people around us. They pass it on to others around them, etc. It's not meant to be a time to go around and shake hands and hug everybody in the worship area. It's not meant to be that because it's meant to be a chain of, of sharing. Same thing, the presider, he should not leave the altar. People should come up to the presider and he greets them. The idea being the spirit of Christ is at work passing through everybody and being touched by everybody from person to person. Then the assembly, they celebrate the reception of the Eucharist, Holy Communion, and under the form of bread and wine, if they wish. The ritual of the church allows for communion as the fuller form, the fuller sign of Eucharist is the bread and the wine. 
there's times when we cannot share the wine because of perhaps sickness that's going around, some kind of flu or something. But sacraments are be the presented through the minister. Jesus fed 5,000 people in the desert. He didn't put the bread in the, after he multiplied it, didn't lay it out and say, okay, now everybody come on up and take your own. He gave it to his disciples to distribute. So the presider and no one else actually, or other presbyters were present, they take it, but then no one else takes it. Even the Eucharistic ministers don't take it. It's meant to be presented by those who are ministers right from the center, they're presiding. So the communicant then when they come forward, they look at the host and the ordained, the minister says the body of Christ. They bow their heads, slight bow and respond, amen, and receive and consume the host. The blood of Christ is given, they bow their head. When the, when the minister says the blood of Christ, they bow their heads and say, amen. And then they take the chalice. They may receive the Eucharist in the hand. And the way that's done, we put one hand over the other. If a person's right-handed, they'll put their left hand on top, their right hand underneath. If a person's right-handed, they put their right hand, uh, hand um, left-handed, excuse me, they put their right hand on top. But the idea behind that is kind of like a little cradle for receiving the Eucharist. And so we receive the Eucharist, and then we take and consume it. And so that's what it is, is the idea being that we consume the Eucharist. Actually, the faithful sharing the consecrated wine, this is closer to the real form, and it's been revived by the church. The idea of taking communion in the hand, that goes back to the early church. And that's where we have description of how to do it, is in the early church, the saints. They tell us how to do it. A person may take it on the tongue if they wish. Usually for ministers of the Eucharist, there's usually two ministers of the wine, and what someone asked me one time is, what about individual drinking cups? I went to a service, and everybody had an individual drinking cup. No, the idea is the one cup. Sometimes there's several cups because of the large crowd, but as much as possible, a single cup or a sharing cup. Then the celebration of the communion rite, followed by a period of silence. And after communion, we then have the presider stands up, and now he prays the prayer and then he gives a blessing. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It ends with the words, go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. The assembly prays the final grateful response to the word, thank be to God. And then it's sent forth to carry the gifts of the Eucharist out into life. It doesn't really end there. It really is meant to be a continuation of carrying on. Then we have a few things, a few kind of rules that we have in the church. Why do Catholics believe so strongly in celebrating the Eucharistic liturgy on Sunday? The scriptures say it was the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the seventh day. That's a Saturday. Christians celebrate the resurrection day of Jesus. That's why we celebrate it. God created the world in seven days. On the eighth day, Jesus was raised. We're actually celebrating the eighth day. The first seven days, that was the creation of the world. Now a new creation has begun, the eighth day. In the early church, they used to build some baptistries with eight sides to bring this out. So the eighth day is really the first day of the following week. So they saw the day of resurrection as the day when Christ was raised and the day to be celebrated. What happened in the early church period, too, was that very often sundown was the beginning of the next day. Sundown on Saturday was actually seen by some, many, as the beginning of Sunday. And the church, knowing this, has now permitted us to have liturgies on Saturday evenings. And it says around sundown, but that's kind of a normal mode of thinking. Sundown is when it's ordinarily sundown. Daylight saving time come, and we talk about sundown, the sun is still out. But that's not what happens all year round. What is norm for the whole year, that's sundown. And so the church allows people to come on Saturday evening as part of their celebration for the Sunday. And the idea behind it, a helpful idea, is that there are many people who in our society today are forced to work on Sundays. They have no choice. So what happens is they can celebrate Saturday evenings. The church then continues to talk about this great gift and other rules. Person in serious sin and are not able to get to reconciliation, 
they can they can they make an act of contrition, what they call a real act. Of, if they have the intention of celebrating the sacrament of reconciliation, they may receive. However, if they're in the state of serious sin and don't intend to go to the Eucharist to uh, reconciliation, then they uh, would, must not receive the Eucharist. When we receive the Eucharist, we don't go up by as people saying, look how great I am. We don't do it that way. When we go to the Eucharist, we're saying, God, I need your help. And so the idea behind Eucharist is not a reward for being good. It's because we're weak and we need help. So what happens is the church, we're beginning to say, this is what it means to really share in Eucharist. So the Eucharist, the greatest of gifts. And so we have in the church then reasons for sharing in the Eucharist. All those baptized, all children who are baptized and have reached the age of reason, the age of being able to understand the Eucharist, they then are called to share in the Eucharist at in the same as other Catholics. Some regulations concerning Eucharist, once these children reach the age of discretion, yes, they're obliged. They're obliged to go. Parents are obliged to prepare them for this. Catholics in serious sin, again, they should refrain from receiving the Eucharist. Again, not seen as a reward for being good, but as a help. And then they should ordinarily, Catholics should ordinarily fast one hour before Eucharist. This doesn't include medicine or water. In fact, those who care for the advanced in age, those who suffer from infirmity, or those who take care of them may receive communion without fasting. And we have something called the Easter duty. The Easter duty is kind of a sad thing in some ways. It says Catholic who has been initiated into the Eucharist must receive communion at least once a year during the Easter season. Easter season is from the first Sunday of Lent to uh, this Trinity Sunday. It was approximately 60 days after Easter. And the reason for that rule is because at one time in history, unfortunately, people began to feel, I'm not worthy enough to receive the Eucharist. A, a misconception of what the Eucharist was about. And so they didn't feel worthy, so they rarely went to communion. Church says, no, no, it, it's not because we're so good. We need help. And then the United States bishops They've also established norms for celebrating Eucharist for persons with intellectual or developmental disabilities. That's important in our present day, of course. Regulations for these communions, it's the same as a person with um, any other disabilities. So all persons. This means that the person must be able to distinguish communion from ordinary food. If they can do that, then they can share in Eucharist. So that's the rule, the same rules for them as we would have, let's say, for those who are re reach the age of reason. When doubts exist, they should be solved in the direction of allowing the person to receive Eucharist. For Catholics who regularly receive, develop the advanced Alzheimer's or some other age-related dementia, the presumption is that they receive as long as they have the ability to distinguish communion from regular food. So that's really something the church is really concerned about. Catholics who are gluten intolerant, they should be given the opportunity to receive a small fragment if they can do that. Or if not, they should be provided for a low gluten host, or if they can't take the host to take the wine. And so that's one of the things that we're asked to do in uh, our lineage. There's some of the rules. We have a devotion, some devotions in honor of the Eucharist, Blessed Sacrament. We have benediction. Benediction, the Eucharist, sometimes when they celebrate the Eucharist, there's also some hosts left over. We put them in a tabernacle. The word tabernacle means little house. For those who cannot worship, we take that Eucharist and can bring it to the people who are sick, not able to get out of their homes, those who request communion. And then we also have a devotion sponsors called benediction. Benediction is a special service in honor of the sacramental presence of Christ. Usually consists in the host being taken and put it into a large monstrance where people can see it and come together and worship to honor Christ. It's a communal veneration of Christ in the Eucharist. However, it can never claim to be greater than the Eucharistic celebration. In fact, they would rather that we didn't have it follow immediately upon the Eucharistic celebration 
because we move from a great form of worship to a good form of worship. But to rather than do that, it should not be celebrated immediately after the Eucharist. As far as monetary offerings go, uh, in the early church, people gave some things to the presider, to the ordained priest, for the poor, to be shared with the poor, or to support the clergy. A custom continues today in the church. Its liturgy is for the universal church. So what happens is someone comes and says, I would like to have a liturgy celebrated for so-and-so. The idea is all liturgies are for the universal church, but we may pray for a specific person or intention. And so that's what the offering is made for. More important than just offering for that, the person who asks for that should actually participate where able. Then donations for the clergy or a parish at times of weddings, funerals, baptisms. Again, this is an offering made to compensate, but at the same time to help, whether the poor or the clergy or the parish. An offering, if even the offering cannot be made, the presbyter may not refuse to celebrate a sacrament. That's kind of a norm for the church. And so what's happening? We talked about Eucharist. Eucharist is a gift from God. In fact, it's the greatest gift from God. We enter into union with Christ and worship God the Father through him, with him, and in him. And so we become one with Christ. It concludes, the Eucharist concludes the sacraments of initiation, baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. Usually when children share in the sacrament of Eucharist in those dioceses where they share confirmation before Eucharist, it usually confirmation precedes it by perhaps several months. And then through the sacraments of initiation, we share in the privilege of belonging to the family of Christ. Even better, we're one with Christ. That's how close we are to each other and to the family. Together we share a memory, a meal, a sacrifice, and we worship as a community. That's what they did at that celebration for their mother when they celebrated her birth, 70th birthday. Every time we come together, we celebrate a memory, a meal, a sacrifice as a community. The greatest gift God can give us calls us together to worship and love God and show our deep love and concern for all that God has done in the world today and in the world throughout history. Let us pray. May the light of Christ lead us. The power of Christ be with us. The wisdom of Christ inspire us. The word of Christ instruct us. The shelter of Christ protect us. The hand of Christ hold us. And the love of Christ be in us. May the grieving find support in us. The sad find joy in us. The depressed find hope in us. The weak find strength in us. The doubters find faith in us. The rejected find love in us. And the world find Christ in us. And we pray that the world will find Christ in each and every one of us. We pray that Christ will find, that the world will find Christ in me. May Almighty God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.